information about uh, patients. And can the host uh, record the, okay, thanks, thank you. Mm. I see that, yes. So good morning, uh, this, the lecture is on intracranial EEG monitoring and I've sh shared this in different stages in the past few years. Uh, this is the beginning. Uh, intracranial monitoring for us is quite essential because patients, a lot, about 30 to 40% patient of patients with epilepsy are refractory to medications and some of them uh, need uh, epilepsy surgery. However, the usual recording may not be able to help us decide the surgical plan and therefore we will need to have uh, intracranial monitoring for some cases. Uh, why, why, why can't we use other modality like MRI and PET scan, how about uh, SPEC and so on? We understand that they are functioning at different uh, level and different stages and looking at the problem from different angles they are not the same as intracranial mon monitoring, which is dynamic and uh, recording a certain area of the brain. As you can see in this picture, biologically, PET scan is good. Temporally, uh, the EEG, scalp EEG are uh, good. But in fact, when we want to look more in the spatial uh, situations, in the uh, more specific area, uh, we will need intracranial monitoring, especially for the deep structure or medial structure or anywhere uh, in the deeper uh, uh, locations of the brain. Conventionally, we use immunology, routine EEG and MRI and some country, uh, some centers use scalp EEG, video EEG monitoring to uh, achieve a concordance uh, in making the decisions to uh, operate for uh, a patient. So if the simulology uh, routine or MRI are concordant, some will go straight for uh, surgery, but some will still go on to do video EG monitoring. And in some other countries, we will add on a PET scan and spec uh, to have a further or more information. But if all this failed to tell us what is the concordant area, we will need an intracranial recording. And I learned intracranial recording first in 2015 from Sizuoka. And they are doing mainly uh, subdural and dead electrodes. This is Fuzi, the location of Fuzi. And you can see that uh, we can uh, see, we can file uh, Fuji from different angles from Mount Kuno, Shimizu, and Ito. And similarly, uh, for epilepsy, we have to look at the seizure uh, epileptogenic zone from uh, different angles as well. So in Sizuoka, these are the things that they are doing and I, I have learned in 2015, mainly subdural uh, EEG, second cortical stimulation, there are WADA tests and MEG. These are the things that I will share with you, but they are not doing steroid EEG in 2015, but I heard they are uh, starting or going to start uh, steroid EEG in Sizuoka. So these are the, the, my homework when I was there for three weeks. Uh, I have uh, go through 10, there are 10 cases of with subdural recording and you can see that in this patient with frontal lobe epilepsy, the subdural grid are so intensely uh, uh, implanted over the frontal regions with additional smaller electrodes in the parietal and crossing the uh, central sulcus. So you can see that how intense is, and if you imagine how big is the craniectomy, wound, it will be as big as this. If you can see my uh, mouse over the frontal region. So it's a very big craniectomy uh, wound. So later on, I'll explain to you why SEG is much better. It's because the skipping the, uh, the, uh, the craniectomy will make patient more comfortable and have less complications and risks. These are the patients who had uh, temporal lobe implantations with language mapping is in fact, subdural is in fact uh, much better in terms of uh, brain uh, mapping, especially for motor area, sensory area and language area. Whereas in SEG, it is less, but uh, I'll, in, I'll let you know what are the 
other benefits of SEEG. So uh, these are their recording in the Sissoka and you can see that they are using a very special uh, channels montage. They actually skip uh, the channels in between. As they told us, uh, if you have not enough channels, let's say we have only 64 uh, hit box to start off with, rather than 128 or 256 hit box, we can always start intracranial monitoring by skipping electrodes, which will help us to record a larger area, but uh, using a smaller uh, hit box. And the, in, in Japan, they do a lot of uh, frequency analysis. This is high frequency oscillation and very high frequency oscillations. I'm mainly looking for frequency more than 100 Hertz. So from 100 to 200 Hertz is high HFO, high frequency oscillation, or any frequency more than 1000 is very high frequency oscillation. And you can see that the main setting is the H high frequency filter, HFF, which I've uh, marked in yellow, that they have used 300 Hertz for HFO and 3000 Hertz for VHFOs. In Malaysia, we also try to do and try to capture HFO and show you some examples uh, later on. If you are using time constant, uh, the time constant for 160 is 0 0.001. The sampling rate, uh, most machines nowadays can go up to 4000 Hertz and some machines can go to 10,000 Hertz uh, to help us to record higher frequency uh, activities. And you can see that in G23 and G34, which the phase reversal is G3, there is a very fast frequency activity here. And just remember, this is what 100 millisecond, or in this, this is one uh, uh, very high uh, frequency uh, rate. Whereas very high frequency os oscillation, we need higher sampling rate and we need higher uh, high frequency filter. And to, to the time base we use is as low as 10 millisecond bar here rather than one second bar as we usually do for our routine EEGs. Whereas they also look for a, a slow wave, which is DC shift and a very low frequency oscillation. The frequency is as low as 0 0.1 Hertz for a DC shift and uh, 0 0.01 to 0 0.025 Hertz for VL have a very low frequency oscillations. And the key point is the low frequency uh, filter is as low as you can. The one that we can use is 0 0.01 in some machines. This will help us to look at the wave which are very slow. So I also show you the time constant if you are using time constants in your machines. For this map, you can, the main, the key point is the time base is 10 seconds. So every short segment is 10 seconds and therefore this wave is only one wave over 10 seconds and therefore the frequency is 0 0.1 Hertz, which is a very show, slow uh, ether DC shift, which is significant to tell us the epileptic zone or ether onset zone. Very Low frequency oscillation, the map is go as low as 30 second bar here, or sometimes we use 100 second bars to see the slow wave, which with only one wave over or two wave over uh, 100 seconds, which are very slow. And these are their cortical mapping in Sizoka. And you can see that beside mapping, they also map which are the area with integral discharges. IID is integral discharges. HFO, VHFO, and DC shift. And they, this is uh, done in almost every patient in Sisoka when they, whenever they are doing intracranial monitoring. For subdural and that we start after uh, our visit to Sisoka, we have set up our uh, monitoring protocol. And you can see that we have record uh, 4,000 Hertz only for one day. And after that, we realized one day of recording to 4,000 Hertz, uh, we will need quite a lot of uh, computer data uh, space. And because of that, nowadays, we only do one hour uh, 4,000 Hertz recording. So while we are doing the recording till Tuesday, when the seizures and integral activities are more, we will increase the sampling rate to 4,000 Hertz for one hour. 
We also use X-ray uh, to inform where our implantations, if we are doing uh, uh, subdural grid or even dead electrodes. And the uh, 10,000 Hertz is able now with a newer latest uh, computer that we have uh, just obtained uh, one or two years, I think last year. And these are the examples that we, are, we have done. This, the first one is intraoperative ECOG. And you can see that these electrodes are put inside the brain only during the operations. Uh, these are all intraoperative, mainly looking for spikes and intake those spikes. Whereas we also do subdural electrodes. For example, in this patient with parietal lobe epilepsy, you can see that the ictal spec is on the right uh, parietal regions. And then we have implanted the subdural plan accordingly. And this is 32 and 16. So total 48 uh, if channels is needed. So if the, if the head block is 64 channels, it should be enough. Uh, for a plant implantation like this. But if you have more electrodes, you may consider a uh, Sizoka method, which you can skip electrodes in between. And these are the recording. You can see a very clear recruiting rhythm in the posterior regions. And the regions is for this patient is over here. And therefore, at the end, we have to extend our implantation slightly backward to see the posterior margin. These are for patients with uh, bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy. MRI show NTS on the right side, but inter, uh, but inter ictal and ictal EEG in the scalp recording show left ictal uh, onset. And because of that, we have done bilateral depth implantations. These are useful for those with MTS, but if you are worried about bilateral uh, epileptogenicity. This is the Nihon Cordon Cortical Stimulation in Sissoka, which I was so amazed with. Uh, they just control each and every channel individually without changing the electrodes. If you look at the one that we use in UM, we are using only this cortical stimulation. And uh, to record, let's say, a point one, uh, to stimulate point uh, contact one, or first contact, we have to plug in the anode and cathode in this simulator. If, if we are recording uh, point two, we have to change the anode and cathode and plug in another electrodes inside this stimulator. So it's very troublesome. Every time when we do cortical stimulation, it takes a long. Now, this is a new software in Natus, and you can see that we can just manually change the electrodes where we want to stimulate one by one by just changing the uh, electrodes inside the computer software. So instead of buying the one in uh, Sizoka, which we didn't, uh, we in fact got a software which has the similar function uh, as what can, we can do in Sizoka. The brain mapping uh, setting is here and I won't go through the details. I just want to let you know these are the actions that they are testing. The motor area, negative motor, sensory, SMA, uh, sensory, uh, uh, negative motor, supplementary negative motor area, SN, SN, SNMA, and language area. And you, can know, you will know that the language mapping is much better with subdural uh, recording. So after doing a mapping, every, every channels that they map, they will try to mark it out where is the motor area. For example, this the purple on the top uh, image is motor, the orange is sensory, and therefore the line in between is the central sulcus. The WADA test used in uh, Sizoka is using propofol seven milligram. Uh, we have tried that in Malaysia uh, for one patient. However, uh, to do a WADA test in Malaysia, we need to pay for the angiogram. Uh, so in fact, the WADA test costs about 3,005 to 4,000 uh, ringgit in Malaysia, which is about 1,000 US dollars. And because of the cost, nowadays we, don't, uh, we didn't, do, didn't do WADA test anymore. And to have the WADA test, we need to book an angio room and we need the radiologist uh, to help us 
uh, in performing the test. Uh, MAC scan, MAC is useful if in looking for radical uh, uh, activities. And I'll show you quickly. Comparing to the scalp uh, activity, uh, MAC is recording the red tangential electro uh, trickle dipole. So if you're looking at the picture on the right lower area, you can see that we are look, looking at the activity across the brain rather than going away from the brain. We have the offer of doing MAC in Kota Baru, which is about, uh, I think, five, maybe 1,000 kilometers from here, or one hour, uh, one, one hour flight from KL. Uh, but for 30 minutes MAC recording, the cost is about 2,000 ringgit, which is about 500 US dollars. And therefore, we have not engaged the service. Uh, because of the limitation and the changes of uh, practice in intracranial monitoring towards stereo EEG, I spent uh, about six months in uh, Cleveland uh, in, at the end of 2016 to 2017, early 2017. It's during the winter period, every day is snowing but, and it's very cold. But what is the advantage of stereo EEG and SEEG is that the, it's using a burr hole, there's no cranectomy. And uh, there is, we can record uh, both uh, hemisphere and even we can record a deep structure like insular and cingulate south uh, cortex. And then we can record multiple lobes from frontal, parietal up to occipital temporal. We can record as uh, many lobes as possible because every implantation depends on uh, a burr hole. And uh, in Cleveland, they are using a ROSA machine, which is a robotic arm to implant the electrodes and you can see in the old days people use frame this is what we are using now in uh, malaysia so a frame will tell us the coordinates of uh, where we want to insert the electrodes and at what uh, directions but in uh, cleveland they are using a robotic arm and you can see that there's no more frame and the robotic arm is much uh, faster and easier and uh, believed to be more accurate but my friend in Australia, Sydney, told me they are using frame as well. Uh, not every country have ROSA. The depth electrodes that we use in the past, the diameter is 1.1 uh, millimeter, whereas the depth electrodes for stereo EEG, the diameter is 0 0.86 millimeter. So it's smaller, it has less risk of bleeding, and uh, you should, the blunt end will avoid uh, the vessels when you get into the brain. These are the template and implantation plans used in uh, Cleveland, and I have copied this uh, for our use uh, in Malaysia. In Cleveland, besides doing uh, uh, learning and looking through their cases, one of the most important things to learn is, in fact, anatomy. There is a very thick book of anatomy whereby we need to memorize or try to. Uh, understand the locations of every single uh, sulcus as well as gyruses because the electrodes that we have implanted, we need to match with uh, anatomical locations as in this uh, picture. So you can see that MHSPY on the left side are individual electrodes. 1, 2, 3 to 14 are the contacts. And the location of every contact need to be mapped to an anatomical locations by matching the electrodes to the MRI. So after that, only we can start looking at the EEG uh, of the S, uh, stereo EEG recording to look for the fast activities. And you can see that because of the number of contacts, uh, the, the screen can be very packed and we have to look at individual uh, channels or segments separately. So these are the frontal lobe uh, planning in one of the patients. Uh, I've gone through about 50 cases uh, while I was in Cleveland uh, over the three months periods. And uh, these 50 cases, this is one of the frontal lobe that I've seen. is thought to be temporal lobe because patients have fear and epigastric aura. But actually at the end, the ictal activities are from the frontal regions. So without covering the frontal uh, area, uh, we are unable to identify the ictal onset. And you can see that 
they also have a very wide coverage over the perisylvian up to the uh, angular gyrus. So this is rather broad uh, coverage, which is one of the advantages of uh, stereo EEG. This is another patient with parietal lobe, and you can see that there are a lot of focus on insular, and all these electrodes will go through from lateral, frontal, and uh, temporal and parietal into the insular and cingulate gyrus. So the cingulate gyrus and insular, the deep structures are very well uh, studied using uh, SEEG. This is our patient uh, that we have done. Uh, the first case is in 2019. She, she's a 43 years old Malay lady having right sided anterior temporal integral discharges occasionally in the right frontal. The semiology are very much like uh, temporal lobe epilepsy occur at night wandering with oral automatism. There is no uh, inter uh, recording that we have captured from scalp EEG. The MRI show right perisylvian atrophy, which I'll show you the picture later on. Voxel based morphometry is another lesson, uh, another technique I learned from uh, Cleveland to look for the structure of the brain in a quantitative uh, manner. And then the, the spec is not done because there's no uh, ictal uh, recording and the PET scan show right temporal hypermetabolism. So this is the MRI on the right side, show a perisylvian atrophy. And now uh, we are worried that the seizures can may be coming from the insular or the frontal operculum rather than the temporal lobe. The PET scan show uh, very intense hypometabolism in the right hippocampus, but there are also some suspicious insular uh, hypermetabolism on the right side over the, uh, the figure on the right, if you can see. This is a PET scan uh, of the patients. So in order to understand where the seizure is coming from, we have planned the implantations covering the insula as well as frontal operculum because we have uh, frontal integral discharges and main uh, recording or electrodes are covered over the temporal regions. And this map will tell us not only the surface of the, of the brain, it also helps us to map the insula in the white line here. And you can see the map of the cingulate sulcus in the white line behind. The, in Malaysia, we have, uh, because of limited resources, we try to limit our implantation to 10 electrodes. But for complicated cases, uh, we may need 12 to 14 electrodes, which will cost a lot. Uh, at the moment, one electrode costs about uh, 1,300 US dollars. So uh, implantation of eight electrodes, that by the cost of electrodes itself, uh, will cost about 10,000 uh, US dollars already. So uh, as I mentioned just now, the hypothesis of this patient can be in the lateral temporal loop or in the frontal operculum or perhaps insular, and therefore implantation plan include all this. If the patient uh, is unable to afford stereo EEG, this is the optional plan that we have uh, decided, which is using subdural and depth electrodes. Subdural for peri uh, Sylvan region, that is for insular uh, recording. Over the uh, this is the second alternative op options. This is the implantation plan, and later on you will know that uh, the plan has uh, moved or changed slightly. So every plan, every electrodes we need to determine where is the entry and where is the targets to know the medial and uh, lateral, the most medial and lateral context of the electrodes. And the stereo EG is done in December last year. And this is the trajectory we do uh, before operations. And this is the frame that you can you see that I mentioned. It was used in Sydney and it was used uh, initially in most centers. And this is how it was drilled through a burr hole and a very tiny electrode of 0.86 millimeter was ended through uh, a screw, a trocar. Post-implantation will identify every single electrode. So every electrode will have a picture, uh, three-dimensional pictures of every single electrode. And then we will map them, overall map, 
to where the entry and the target is. And the red one are the uh, new entry, different from initial plan. And this is the anatomical location of every single channels or contact inside the brain from the very medial side. One, two are in the middle. The smaller numbers are more medial. And the larger number, nine, 10, are more lateral. And you can see that we are only using uh, 10 contacts uh, electrodes in our setting. So after that, we analyze every single interactor at uh, EEG. Look, we look for all the interactor discharges, and then we map to where exactly the area of most active uh, during interactor uh, phase. This is called irritative uh, zone. And after, whenever we have seizures, we'll analyze the ictal onset to see where the seizures started uh, and which, in which channel, in which area. We also uh, analyze the high frequency oscillations. This is in a very specific setting. As you can see, the high frequency filter, we use 500 Hertz. And uh, every activity, fast activities here are captured in one second. <coughs> And the time base is very slow, and therefore we can capture up to 100, 200 hertz uh, activities. We also do cortical stimulation, and as, as I mentioned just now, we managed to have a new software to allow us to do cortical stimulation fast. Uh, don't have to plug in and out as we do in the past. We also add on connectivity analysis uh, in Cleveland, they are using CCEP, which is cortical, cortical evolved potential. Whereas we uh, have, doesn't have the formula or software to analyze that yet. So we are doing a gross uh, connectivity analysis. And you can see here, when, as, when we stimulate the C electrodes, which is C1, we see a lot of activity in O3 and 4 over here and you can from the anatomical map or MRI you can see in fact C1 and O4 are indeed very far away. C1 is at the back of hippocampus which is a hippocampal tail and O4 is in the orbital frontal region. This is similar to broadcast the wind key area in C1 and Broca in O4, but it's not exactly the right uh, anatomy and the likely connectivity is through acute vesiculus. And we also see that the con volume conduction around the electrodes are actually very minimum. Stimulation of C1 only involves C2 and 3, but it didn't go beyond that. After, after we have finished recording and uh, the ICTA EG, we'll discuss and plan where do we think is the epileptogenic zone, which is our hypothesis. So hypothesis decide the epileptogenic zone. In this case, uh, we think it is slightly in the hippocampal head with temporal pole. But we, may, we have a concern whether it's coming from orbital frontal uh, region as well. And because of that, we have offered a patients a uh, various plan. Either we go straight to right anterior temporal lobectomy. Uh, to the good news of this implantation is insular is clear. There is no insular uh, ictal activity. So the plan, the plan is either doing a straightforward anterior temporal lobectomy or including orbital frontal initially or subsequently if we fail. Uh, the first surgery. So in summary, uh, these are the advantage and disadvantage comparing stereo EEG and subdural uh, EEG. The key point I want to mention is that bitemporal onset uh, SEG is much better. Bilateral uh, Epilepsy, SEG is better. Insular, cingulate is also better. Heterotopia, the deep structure, tuberous sclerosis, SEG will give us better answer. And there is very uh, few risks and complications with SEG. But the cost is much, much expensive and we need to learn a new technique. 
of understanding uh, epileptic network. Whereas for subdural, we will know that for mapping, especially motor mapping and language mapping, uh, subdural is better. So if the seizures, if you suspect is coming around uh, a motor or language area, then we should consider subdural uh, EEG. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Hi, hi, morning, Lakshmi here. Um, just checking whether uh, are you using a mic? I'm here. Yeah. Uh, That's me. I can't hear you. Oh. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm Uh, I'm, I'm talking. Can you hear me? Roughly, yes. Not that clear is okay. I am. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We are we are using the lab's laptop. Last week was Uma's laptop, so we need to sort out the audio. I just want to check whether our meeting has gone beyond forty minutes. To this is a IT department's license for a month. Yes. As you can see, we start the host at 8.15. Okay. So now it's 9.02. So, so 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah. So, so because, uh, so it's working then. Yeah. So what, what I propose is we will start our lectures. Uh, I mean, to invite everybody, we will normally set up about 8.15. Then, then, uh, like just like today, then we can gather everybody and, and accept all the invitations. Yeah. So, so yeah. I think I think it worked out fine today. I don't know if anyone else from elsewhere have any uh, questions to ask. I'm not sure. Can I ask a simple question, uh, King Siang? Yes. Uh, with stereo EEG, you don't actually insert deep into the, the substance of the brain parenchyma like you would depth electrodes, right? You uh, just put it on the depth. surface. It's a depth electrode. So you actually go through so, into the substance of the cortex here. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the contact is yes. inside yes. insular and singulate. Yes. Yeah. So you're not putting it on you're not just putting yes. it on the surface, yes. like, right? Yes. yes. The surface are ah, yeah, no. Alright. Ah, okay, can hear you, Naim. Naim. Naim can yeah. mute. You better Sorry. mute, yeah. Ah, yes, correct. The electrodes is a depth electrodes design, but it's uh, uh, thinner and it will go into the substrates. And so the targeting is using the stereotactic frame. La. Correct. Mm -hmm. Like okay. what they do for deep brain Surgery. stimulation. Yeah. yeah, okay. I saw Imran from UK. <laughs> No, Imran is back home. Oh, hi, Imran. <laughs> you are back home. Have you finished your quarantine, Imran? Yes, Prof. I finished my quarantine. Please uh, <laughs> rescue me. <laughs> oh, come back, come back. Uh, Imran has, has kindly volunteered to come back, but we are waiting for Sumbal Matnusi to swamp him up. I think the Dean has written to them, isn't it? She said so. Yes. Yes, I'm uh, bored to death at home already. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, hopefully we go and bug them again, I guess, yeah. And we yes. have um, problem. Did you did you yes. see my question? I was asking about uh, whether you could localize things functionally based on their their specific um, EEG patterns. I'll uh, I'll yes. use my microphone now. Yeah. Yes. I'll show you the pictures. So as you can see here, every channel we can do cortical stimulations and uh, from the simulation we can determine what uh, is the function. Although sometimes it's not easy, for example in insula uh, on these patients, patients develop vertigo when we stimulate the posterior insula. So uh, and vertigo is one of the autonomic functions uh, controlled by uh, the insula. And the parietal lobe, we didn't implant the sensory and motor area, but if we do, we will be able to see motor uh, stimulations 
For example, electrode stimulation in the motor cortex will result, will result in a motor movement of either the face, arm, and legs, depends on which area we stimulate. The EEG pattern. Ah, the EEG patterns are uh, the EEG patterns are very similar in intracranial monitoring, which we are looking for uh, fast recruiting rhythm. So it doesn't mean that the different area have different uh, EEG patterns. Okay. So uh, do you all have any other questions? You can either write in chat or you can uh, unmute your mic and ask me directly. By the way, I see uh, Dr. Sai from uh, Laos. Hi, Dr. Sai. Dr. Sai haven't unmute. Dr. Sai, you, haven't un you have not unmute. Yes. Hi, good morning, Dr. Sai. Hello, everyone. Yes. Thank you Prof, for your very nice lecture. It's nice to know about and know about the modern about technique. Yes, good to catch up as well. Mm. <laughs> I have no question because so uh do you all have any other questions? Uh so in summary, this is more like a journey of how I learned uh, intracranial monitoring from uh, very beginning. And uh, I want to show that it's always possible and to start small, and then we can slowly uh, increase the intensity and difficulty in our intracranial monitoring. Uh, thank you uh, very much, everyone. Thank you, King Xiang. And thanks to Lechimi and team to help set this up as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lachimian team. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Prof.